Hi, I'm Janet Bufton with Adam Smith Works. Hi, I'm Lynn Kiesling. I'm an economist. Awesome. This is the Smith Questionnaire. So Lynn, I'm going to jump right into it. Would you rather be loved or lovely? This is a trick question, right? No, the, the, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a trick question. It's a rhetorical question. Lovely. Awesome. Uh, wealth of nations or theory of moral sentiments? Oh, that's like asking chocolate or peanut butter, right? They're two great tastes <laughs> right, that taste better. great together. That's a really good answer. <laughs> so if Adam Smith had a dog, what kind of dog would he have? Um, I want to say he would have a bull mastiff Ooh. who would be able to pull him out of the lime kilns that he falls <laughs> down when he's walking around absentmindedly thinking his own thoughts. <laughs> He needs his personal rescue dog. That's a good one. Yes. <laughs> or St. Bernard, you know. Oh, yeah. I could, see, I could see either of those. What is the best antidote to the torpor induced by the division of labor? What is the best antidote? Um... I think if I'm putting, if I'm putting myself in Smith's head, I'm going to say uh, lively activities and diversions, because of course the division of labor leaves you more time for things like leisure. And uh, this is where I can put on my economic historian hat and say one of the fun facts about um, certainly the, the kind of uh, well, reasonably well-paid workers in like the cotton textile manufacturing industry actually owned like pianos and had um, memberships in circulating libraries and clubs where they would go and, you know, take out books and have reading groups and, you know, so they would play music or, or go to their reading group. Um, and I think that gets rid of the torpor of the division of labor. Yeah, for sure. That's actually something I didn't know. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so this is a very serious question. Do you think Adam Smith would rather fight one horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? <laughs> uh, I think a horse-sized duck would be less agile and nimble than 100 <laughs> duck-sized horses. And so it would be easier to kind of faint and, and uh, yeah. So I would say the duck sized horse, the horse sized duck. That okay. That, I think that's probably the one that I lean towards, but I don't know that there's a right answer. <laughs> so what development since Smith in economics do you think he might appreciate the most if he could learn about them today? And I know you're being put on the spot, so. Yes, there's just so <laughs> there's many. There's a lot, yeah. Well, and especially as, as, as an economist who is in part a historian of technology, you know, the things going through my head right now are just, <laughs> And I don't want to say the internet because I think that's kind of uh, the kind of obvious but superficial Mm -hmm. You know, of course, he would appreciate the internet, but but I'm gonna I, I'm gonna try to pick some piece of Smith language to and and use this to give a pitch for for an industry that I know and love because I think Smith really likes universal convenience. Okay. Right. Things things that that increase the universal convenience for all people and. Uh, uh, so I'm going to go with electricity. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going that, with electricity. Yeah, that but reminds electricity me. Electricity is my jam, so. That's true. It reminds me of um, Eleanor Ostrom at one point. Ostrom. I, I, I only ever have to read it. Um, at one point said something that was quoted in an article about the little wonders of everyday life. Uh, yes. And it seems, it, I think that you're right. I think Smith would... Um, being someone so sympathetic. I can definitely well, see that. And, and this, the little wonders of everyday life is a great phrase. And, and 
Uh, Alfred Marshall had a similar one. You know, he called, and of course Smith didn't read Marshall because Marshall was a century later than Smith, mm -hmm. but Marshall called economics um, the study of the business of everyday life. Ah, cool. So, yeah, there's a nice, a nice thread there from Smith to Marshall to Ostrom. Uh, that makes me happy. <laughs> uh, so, Smith says that one of the times we experience sympathy is when we share an appreciation for the same piece of literature or work of art. What should people read, listen to, or watch to feel sympathy with you? Um, I have candidates for all three. Can I give one of each? Sure. Uh, or maybe two of each. Uh, read, I think, um, and, and, and in the spirit of this, uh, I would say Cryptonomicon, but more the Baroque cycle. So Neil Stevenson. Okay. Right. But, but in that kind of Cryptonomicon to the Baroque cycle as the backstory to Cryptonomicon or um, basically anything by Jane Austen. Right? Okay. And so I don't know how you put those two together to form <laughs> sympathy with me, but, but I'm sure uh, I know you and I have fellow feeling into both of them. That's true, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and to listen to, I would say Schubert's Ninth Symphony. Okay. Which is, uh, or, or a, a really good piece of uh, 15th, 16th century choral polyphony from England. Um, that's the other format of music that I've been listening to uh, of kind of classical music. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, awesome. So if you could host a dinner party with Adam Smith, who else would you invite? Oh, well, I would want to invite Hume because I get the feeling that you get the two of them in a room together and it would be kind of like, you know, the old married couple. <laughs> <laughs> and that that would be fun because of, yeah. you know. Um, I would, uh, how many people am I allowed to have? I think that that's actually part of the, part of your answer. Oh, good. I like a big, I like a big dinner party, but you know, once you get beyond four people, then the conversation groups start to kind of fragment. But um, I think it would be fun to have a conversation with Smith and Hume with my friend and mentor and thesis advisor, Joel Mokir. That would be really fun. That would be so much fun. Um, I would never get a word in edgewise with the three of them. <laughs> And I'm a talker. <laughs> <laughs> but think how much you would learn. Oh, my brain would be overfull and overfull with joy as well. <laughs> so I have, uh, I have another um, one of these, as you know, with Dominique Lozanski, and she's going to have to forgive me for not having thought of this question for her. Uh, so at your dinner party, what cocktail would you serve to Adam Smith and why? Oh, well, my, my husband, the cocktail whisperer, is actually sitting across the room, so I could ask him what cocktail we should serve to Adam Smith. Um, but it should be a cocktail that has some whiskey in it, of course, because he's mm -hmm. Scottish, so we should have some whiskey. Um, th there's a... Um, I think, is it the Maximilian Affair that has whiskey in it? Maximilian Yeah, there's a there's a, a a cocktail I really like called the Maximilian Affair that has whiskey in it. Um, okay. Yeah. Now I'm gonna have to have one. Th those are the rules, right? <laughs> good. That's a good rule. You have a cocktail you haven't had. You have to have it. <laughs> oh, I'm getting I'm I'm getting a flyby. Um, <laughs> oh, my the cocktail whisperer suggests the Atoll Bros, which has Orange blossom honey, uh, doers, oatmeal water, drambuie, and uh, amaretto, and single I, cream. I'd drink that. I would drink that too. <laughs> All right, so I have one more question. If an afterlife exists, what do you want to discuss with Smith when you get to meet him?
I would probably want, I would probably geek out on the, you know, try to pick apart to what extent he saw beyond the labor theory of value. Ah. Right? Because, um, you know, we know that, we know that um, the sh kind of paradigm shift in terms of, of value theory, right? The where do prices come from shifts in the 1870s uh, from, you know, the labor theory of value, which is um, the pearl has value because I dive for it. And the value of the pearl is determined by all of the inputs into diving for it. And we shift to marginal utility theory of value, which is I dive for the pearl because it has value. Right. And, um, and you know, it, but it's not like we flipped a switch in 1871 and everyone started using this new way of thinking. It's, you know, in 1848, John Stuart Mill is kind of pushing in that direction. And I always characterize Mill as having kind of a foot in each canoe. So he's got a foot in the labor theory of value canoe and a foot in the marginal utility theory of value canoe. And he's kind of, you know, keeping the two together. Um, <laughs> that's a little, ooh. but he's kind of kicking the door open for, for marginal utility. And, you know, Smith, Smith is, is not a utilitarian in the same sense that Mill and, and subsequent economists were, but but you still get these glimmers of of the idea of of prices being determined by something other than the labor content of the commodity, and so I would geek out with him about that to try to to see, you know, to try to push back on his labor theory of value and see you know, how far, how far we could get. Um, I might also, you know, there, there's just things that I would ask him to connect between his different essays. So like, you know, the history of astro astronomy essay where you get all of this spontaneous order and complexity articulated and you see glimmers of it in TMS and Wealth of Nations, but you know, I would I would definitely want to have the conversation with him to connect the dots across like his essay on the history of language, which also has the complexity and emergence, yep. um, the history of astronomy, and then the other the two main works, and just you know, kind of connect the spontaneous order dots. Um, so those are the two big things that I would want to talk to him about. Yeah. I'd be a fly on the wall. That would be pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I might also want to ask him the kind of, you know, how, how the, 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 as Tyler Cowan would say, the Adam Smith production function, right? <laughs> how, how do you, how do you structure your work so that you're productive? Um, I mean, yeah, he might say badly, right? When you read his letters, he's always like, oh, I've been so unproductive. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, it's, you know, something, there is something that clearly works for him. Yes. And, yeah, I would be curious to know what that is. I agree. All right. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for asking me. <laughs>